from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Hello, I'm Frank Wright. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. I invite you to visit our website at djkm.org where you can find a digital audio and video collection all from a biblical perspective. Years ago, while traveling in Australia, I was struck by a newspaper headline. The story told of a woman mistakenly deported from Australia to the Philippines. There, a group of Roman Catholic nuns cared for her and let her live with them at a hospice home that they were operating. During her four years at the hospice, her family did not know where she was, and they thought that she had died. They were absolutely heartbroken. The newspaper headline read, Wrongfully Deported Woman Found Living Among the Dying. But we also live among the dying, with a modern-day slaughter of the innocents taking place in our midst through the abortion of preborn children, in large part through a denial of their basic humanity. Yet the scripture tells us that each of these little ones was made in the image of God. Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with his message, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the 139th Psalm. Psalm 139, we shall begin our reading with the seventh verse. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And may God speak to us today from his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. Today I would like to tell you about something that I sincerely doubt that a handful of you have ever heard of before something which is of enormous consequence and of great importance. It is a scientific discovery which indeed impacts strongly upon our faith. And it has been described by a scientist as one which is to be ranked with the greatest achievements in the history of science. The discovery rivals those of Newton and Einstein, Lavoisier and Schrodinger, Pasteur and Darwin. It is a discovery which is as momentous as the observation that the earth goes around the sun or that disease is caused by bacteria or that radiation is emitted in quanta, quantum physics. Now, one of the astonishing things is that here is a discovery of such vast proportions 
which almost none of you has heard of before. And that is a story in itself. 3,000 years ago, King David declared that we were fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knows right well. Well, today, we would have to say that what he knew about it was very little. It is obvious even on the surface, as many have observed down through the centuries, that we are an extraordinarily, wonderfully wrought creation, that the human body is indeed astonishing in many ways. And in the middle of this millennium, when modern science began to develop, and by the way, all of the founders of modern science were Christians, and they believed such things that examining the creation would bring us closer to the Creator. Or that in science, said the founder of astronomy, we were merely thinking God's thoughts after him. But something happened on the way to the 20th century, and that is the entire scientific enterprise was hijacked in the middle of the 19th. Of course, I am referring to Darwin's theory of evolution, which as the leading scientist in Canada, who was chosen to write the introduction to the centennial edition of The Origin of Species, said that the greatest evil that Darwin has brought upon the world is to somehow divide science from God and, in fact, set them at each other's throats. And so the whole scientific enterprise has been hijacked into a naturalistic or materialistic view of the world. Naturalism means that there's nothing in the universe but nature. There's nothing supernatural. Materialism believes that there's nothing in the world but matter. A bit of history first. Darwin wrote his book in 1859, The Origin, and after about a hundred years in 1950, the various scientific disciplines paleontology, biology, astrophysics, astronomy, etc., had been going off in their own directions. And when they began to talk to each other, they found that they had a lot of contradictory views. So they got together in about 1950, had a big convention to try to get them all uh, playing from the same score. And they realized that there were a number of parts of Darwinism that just really didn't work. So they came up with a new theory. They're always coming up with new theories. When the facts refute the old one, they simply change it. And so they came up with neo-Darwinism, or the modern Darwinistic synthesis, in, 19, in the 1950s. And they were all there, except one group of scientists weren't invited. They were the, the molecular biologists the biochemists, the microbiologists. And why weren't they invited? Well, they, they just hadn't been born yet. Microbiology really dates its birth from the discovery of Watson and Crick of the DNA, which was, I think, 1957 or 59, the end of that decade. And so the microbiologists have continued apace, thousands of them, for the last 40 years, sort of the uninvited uh, guests that didn't make it to the party. And in the last few years, their discoveries have been revealed, and they are astonishing, as you just heard, as significant as the discovery of the orbit of the Earth around the sun, as, as the bacterial cause of disease, as... as uh, the various mechanisms of uh, uh, 
uh, physics, quantum physics, which probably are lesser known to most people. And what is this incredible discovery? It is, and I quote from <clears throat> Professor Dr. Michael Behe, who is a microbiologist, a biochemist at Lehigh University. <clears throat> and he says in a marvelous book, which I am very indebted to for uh, this <clears throat> message, he says this. He says, what was discovered is that at its base, life is composed of machines. A rather astounding discovery that at our foundational level, and he's talking about the level within the cell, at the molecular level, we are made of machines. Not one or two or 10 or a thousand or a million, but trillions of machines. And we have about a trillion machines in every one of our three trillion cells. Now, this discovery was made because of technological advances in microscopes. In Darwin's day, the microscopes were pretty weak, and uh, so he thought of the cell something like a, ping, a small ping pong ball with a, a pea in it. In fact, it's interesting that the key, the key to persuading people of evolution was the portrayal of cells as simple. Because the whole thrust of evolution is movement from the simple to the complex. And therefore, it had to begin with what Darwin repeatedly called a simple, single cell. And that's what enabled him to convince the scientific world of uh, the possibilities of evolution. Dr. Behe goes on to say that strangely, when finally these microbiologists made this discovery, you would have thought with the magnitude of that victory and made at such great cost of countless millions of hours of human uh, drudgery in front of microscopes for several de decades when they finally discovered what was there that you would have heard a combined shout of Eureka! I have found it! And there would have been thousands of uh, champagne bottles with their corks pop popping and there would be much hand clapping and high-fiving and perhaps even excuse to take the day off with such an incredible discovery as this, and yet no bottles have been uncorked, no hands have slapped. Instead, there is a curious, embarrassed silence that surrounds the stark complexity of the cell. Isn't that amazing? Why is that? Because what they found was not what they wanted to find. They wanted to find something simple, and they found the most complex thing on the face of this earth. And there is this, as he says, eerie silence. Now, it is interesting that Darwin said in his book, he knew the theory of gradual evolution by natural selection carried a heavy burden. And this is what he said. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would be abundant, would absolutely rather break down. Dr. Behe says, that this discovery of irreducible complexity at the very base of life meets that criterion and thus breaks 
down completely destroys the theory of evolution which has taken the entire scientific enterprise hostage for 150 years and not only the scientific enterprise but it has spread to every discipline, every academic discipline and every university in the world. And it is a naturalistic, materialistic view. So though Dr. Behe never claims to be a creationist, he does, however, at the end, come to the conclusion that there is absolutely no other explanation than the fact that there was a great designer. He says, the result of these cumulative efforts to investigate the cell, to investigate life at the molecular level is a loud, clear, piercing cry of design. But you see, evolution will not allow for any design. Evolution says no one took nothing and out of nowhere created everything. Is it any reason that people who are taught that come to believe that there is no purpose for their lives? Dr. Lynn Margulis of the distinguished professor of biology at the University of Massachusetts says this, that history will ultimately judge neo-Darwinism as, quote, a minor 20th century religious sect. And of course, the media is in utter complicity with them. And that's why this has not made the headlines that it should have made. In fact, as I say, Probably few of you have ever read any article in any newspaper about this. There is this eerie silence. But Professor Behe says that the search which he made for books and articles and records and papers of every sort going through vast computer uh, storage to find them, the results always were the same. There has never been a meeting or a book or a paper on details of the evolution of complex biochemical systems. It is beyond their ability to explain. It is indeed the refutation of their view. Why don't they want to see this? Well, he gives an illustration which I like. It says that detectives come to a, a large house with a, with a large room and there they find a man who has been flattened like a pancake in the middle of the floor. I mean, he is as flat as a pancake. I mean, who has done this horrendous crime? And they begin to search for the man who has done this. And they're crawling around on the floor and it seems like they don't notice that standing just a few feet from the man is a very, very large gray elephant. And as they're crawling around on the floor examining with their magnifying glasses the poor pancake man there in the middle of the floor, they avoid bumping into the legs of the elephant and they pretend like, he, like he's not even there. And yet he's so obvious. Any child coming to the door would look at the scene and tell you, well, it's quite evident that the elephant stomped him to into the ground. But you see, they are afraid of the word design. They're afraid that if they have the word design on the side of the elephant and they acknowledge it, that, that just possibly on the other side of the element might be found the word God, who is the great designer. And the conclusion, he says, as we reach the end of this book, we are left with no substantive defense against what feels to be a strange conclusion that life was 
designed by an intelligent agent. And the simple single cell that Darwin postulated and that modern science sought has proven to be a phantom instead. And in place of that, he says they find systems of horrendous, irreducible complexity that inhabit the cell. (laughs) My friends, what this proves is that the kidnappers have been caught. Those that carried away the scientific movement created by Christians to draw us closer to God and have postulated a naturalistic, materialistic, atheistic world and have indoctrinated hundreds of millions of students in it all over the world have been at last found out for what they are, that they have been teachers of falsehoods and they have promulgated promulgated the great lie. It's all false. It could never, ever even have gotten started at all. People sometimes ask if if God has a sense of humor. I think he does. And I trust as this begins to permeate the society, as it inevitably will, you can't censor it completely. And more and more people find out there is going to be a revolution in thinking. An evolution will come to be thought of as merely a small cult of the 20th century, a sect. But I think when the kidnapping took place and people set out to prove that there was no God and that life is the result of merely naturalistic and materialistic causes, God looked down at one of the three trillion cells in your body, each inhabited by a trillion complex machines. And he looked into those, that machinery and he smiled and he said, <laughs> wait till they get a look at this. May we pray. Father, we thank thee that thou that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh at the ungodly who seek to remove you from the very world that you created and who though themselves made by your hand deny their maker and seek to bring others to disbelief. We pray, O Lord, that this marvelous discovery will take its place in the list of vastly important discoveries of the past and the full spiritual and religious significance of it will begin to be understood and people will see that the greatest scientific statement about origins that has ever been made is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In thy name, amen. How wonderful to know that we're not just some fluke of nature, but rather we are fearfully and wonderfully made by a gracious Heavenly Father. More people need to hear that. Do you know the one who gave you life? The one who woke you up again this morning? 
If not, that can change right now. You see, God created us to have fellowship with Him. He wants to give us the free gift of eternal life so that we can enjoy life to the full now on this earth and spend eternity with Him in heaven. It's a gift because we can't earn it, and we don't deserve it because of our sin. Scripture tells us that we are all sinners. But God, in His infinite mercy, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to pay for our sins, and to purchase a place for us in heaven. Would you like to know that your sins have been paid for, and that you can have a relationship with God from this day forward? If so, pray with me this prayer right now, saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I don't deserve your favor, but I believe you died for me, and I place my trust in you for eternal life. Please cleanse me from my sins. Change me into the person you want me to be, and help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we have a special gift we'd like to send you called Beginning Again. Dr. Kennedy wrote this book for new believers just like you. In these pages, you'll learn how to read and study the Bible, how to pray, and how to tell others about what you've just done. It's our gift to you when you write to our address or call our toll-free number. Just ask for it by name, Beginning Again. God bless you as you do. As Dr. Kennedy just explained, the astonishing complexity of the human body reveals God as designer and creator. The practice of abortion is rooted in an evolutionary worldview. In this view, human beings are simply the product of matter, time, and chance with no inherent value beyond what society chooses to give them. And because children in the womb are less fully developed, Some say they are fair game to be targeted and eliminated. The pro-life movement has made impressive strides in recent years in helping people once again understand the true humanity of the baby in the womb. You'll want to share this message with friends and family, perhaps your pastor and your church, helping people understand the biblical truth that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God is one of the most important contributions we can make to the cause of saving innocent preborn children. We will send you a copy of this program on DVD or CD as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll free. 888-332-3069 888-332-3069 or go online to djkm.org I'm Frank Wright thanks for joining us on Kennedy Classics we'll see you next time this has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries <laughs>